Welcome to The Whole Pineapple. I'm Ruby Boris. And I'm Ann Judge. The Whole Pineapple is a podcast about wellness focused around fertility. And on these weekly mini episodes, we bring you bite-sized ideas for you to snack on. Like breathing exercises, book reviews, maybe we'll review some scientific research, or we'll share some wellness and fertility stories from our listeners. So if you're looking for a tip or a trick related to your fertility and well-being, then you've come to the right place. Let's dig in. Welcome back to the whole pineapple. This is the the shirt, the mini one, the snack size, the, the snack, fun size, the fun yeah. fun size. That's what I was going for. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have something really special today. We have a listener episode, and I think, Anne, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce our guest. Perfect. So I am very pleased and excited to welcome my friend and my former coworker Amanda. She and I sat next to each other um, starting, gosh, over a decade ago. Um, and so she has just a really interesting fertility story to share because she both worked in the industry for a long time, um, but also ended up going on her own journey and not necessarily one that I think um, people always think about. I think there are a lot of us that work in the field that kind of got interested in fertility care because we struggle to conceive, but that is not Amanda's story. And it's, I think, a wonderful example of just all the many ways that there are to build a family. And I'm so happy that she's willing to come in and share her journey with us. Hi, Anne and Ruby. It's so good to see you both again. I miss you both so much. And um, I'm really excited that you invited me to be on your podcast and share my story. I love talking about the way that I built my family and the journey that I took. And I love sharing it. And I'm so glad to be able to share it with your listeners today. I mean, I think you can just start wherever you want to start. Tell us a little bit about um, kind of how you ended up where you are now. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in, the, in the short amount of time. In the short know. amount of time. <laughs> right. So I am so you know, going back, I have a um, so I have a 14 year old daughter named Marley. And I actually conceived her very easily. I had no, no, no issues there. Um, but when I was about halfway through my pregnancy, we discovered that Marley may have some congenital anomalies. And we did through all the genetic testing and everything came back normal. And we continued on with the pregnancy. And then Marley was born with multiple congenital anomalies. And the thought was, was that she had an autosomal recessive disorder, which mean that, she, that my husband, Jason, and I had both passed on a gene to her. Um, that was responsible for all the the issues that she was having. But we didn't have any genetic tests to confirm that. Um, I was a fertility nurse at the time, and I understood the whole implications of autosomal recessive genetic diseases. And while we didn't have a confirmation from early at that time, um, I decided that I didn't want to take the risk um, of having another child with special needs. Um, I knew that our risk could, could be potentially 25, maybe even up to 50%, depending on whatever genetic disease that she was found to have. And I didn't want to take that risk. Unfortunately, I worked with a, a woman at, a t at the time, and um, she and her, her partner, so her name is Erica and her partner, Natalie, um, they had a daughter about the same time. They ended up doing IVF because they're a lesbian couple. And they had tried to conceive for a while using IUI with donor sperm, but Erica has PCOS and it was really hard to get her to ovulate um, regularly and consistently. And so she decided, they decided together to do IVF and they created, gosh, I don't remember now, probably like, I'll, I'll say in the ballpark of maybe like 20 to 25 embryos. Um, she was 25 at the time when she made them. Yeah. So she had a lot of embryos and um, they just wanted one daughter. Um, so she had a lot of leftover embryos. And so she offered the embryos to me. And I... And what was your to, thought initially? Like, I put you put yourself <laughs> back. Was, were you surprised? Were you even in the place to think about it? Or, I mean, I knew at that point, um, once we had made the decision to have an, not have any more biological children, I knew that my options, I knew my options because I was a fertility nurse. So I knew right. my options were either to use an egg donor, a sperm donor, or adopt embryos. And I knew that using an egg donor was super expensive and time consuming. Sperm donor less expensive, but um, you know also very time consuming, and I and it's a weird way to put it, but it kind of just fell into my lap this way. Yeah. I mean, 
I wasn't really good friends with Erica, but we bonded on the fact that we both had babies at the same time and we bonded throughout our pregnancies. And, you know, Erica's just a wonderful person and wanted to offer me these embryos. And so I didn't say immediately yes. Of course, I wanted to talk with Jason about it. Um, I guess I kind of had to convince him, you know, as a, hey, I'm a nurse, I'm a fertility nurse, <laughs> and I know, and, and this is what I think we should do. And and he agreed. And uh, we told Erica and Natalie, yes, we would happily take their embryos. And we went through all the legal agreements. I certainly wasn't ready. You know, Marley was just a few months old, and we were still grappling with all of the diagnosis and doctor's appointments and just adjusting to also being new parents, um, as well as being parents of a child with special needs and right. what would all that mean. And so we waited a few years. I knew I wasn't ready. Um, but when Marley was about two and a half years old, we decided we were ready. And I was nearing 35 at the time. And my husband said to me, what do you want for your 35th birthday? <laughs> and I said, I want a baby. And he was like, oh, okay, wow. <laughs> no, nothing else that comes in, no. in a small no. box on Amazon <laughs> because that's harder. Right, exactly. And so then at that point, I went through the process of, you know, um, the embryos were stored down at the fertility clinic in San Francisco. And, um, and tell so, people for people that aren't like us and work in the industry, yeah. like what's involved in doing a cycle when the embryos have already been created? Like how complicated is it? Um, it's actually not that complicated. I, I think a lot of it is mostly just coordinating, you mm -hmm. know, so and, and signing all the legal documents. We did yeah. have to consult with a family attorney up here in Seattle, somebody who specializes in what we call third party reproduction. So people who use eggs or egg donors, sperm donors, embryos from other people. And um, so we consulted with her, we made up a legal document, um, we consulted with um, Erica and Natalie's lawyers. It was very simple. And then I just had to coordinate with the clinic. So the embryos were down there. I knew that I wanted to fly down there to have my embryo transfer. I thought it would be easier for me to fly down there than to go through the process of transferring the embryos up to Seattle. Mm -hmm. And I felt comfortable. They were at the clinic that I worked at. I was really yeah. familiar with their lab. I knew their, the doctors. I kind of, I you know, I felt really comfortable going down there. And so it, there was some coordination in, involved, but it wasn't too complicated. I had to do a uterine evaluation, which I did at SRM. I chose to do a natural frozen embryo transfer cycle where I used my own body's ability to grow a follicle and ovulate to then determine when I would fly down to San Francisco. So I had a small window of time of when to fly down, but since my cycles were regular, I could kind of plan that ahead. Um, and so then, um, yeah, I did my cycle. Um, I believe, Anne, you gave me my trigger shot. I did shot. give you your trigger shot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was I'm, great. I'm, I'm a tiny, tiny bit responsible. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are. And, um, and then, uh, you know, a couple of days later, I, I flew down to San Francisco. Um, had the embryo transfer. That was actually a little stressful because the plan was to thaw some embryos. Um, and they, a, a couple of the embryos didn't survive the thaw, mm -hmm. which was a little bit panicking for me. Especially um, in that moment, you're yeah. all on hormones, <laughs> you're flowing there, you just, you you never know exactly how it's going to go. And I'm sure it was odd for you being on the patient side after having worked in the clinic and been, you know, on that coordination side to be the one on the table has to feel very strange. <laughs> Right, exactly. Yes, definitely. And, and they were, you know, the, the team was really great at, at, at kind of calming down, as I think that <laughs> fertility providers are really good about helping you kind of recenter yourself yeah. and uh, make the, you know, the best decision that's, you know, I was ready to like, hey, let's throw in two embryos. Let's just, you know, oh, my gosh. <laughs> And they were like, no, we're not going to do that. You know, we're going to, we're just going to transfer. We've got this really, actually not even that great of an embryo. It was actually just an okay looking embryo. Um, do, you, but do you tell her that all the time? I do now? tell her that. <laughs> um, I do tell her that. <laughs> I tell her a lot of stories. Okay. Uh, but then, yeah, they, they transferred it. And, you know, I, and then a couple of days later, I flew back up to Seattle, had my, did a home pregnancy test because, you know, I mean, <laughs> who doesn't in a way, you know, had to know, but did the blood tests and had the great rising, you know, more than doubling HCG levels. And, um, you know, and it worked. And then, you know, in nine months later, I had my daughter, Lila. So that was, that's basically the story. And then a kind of a, a bit of an addendum to that story is that, well, because there were so many embryos that were created, I only went through five of those embryos um, to have Lila. And then there was about nine left. And then 
with Erica and Natalie's blessing, I found a woman named Serafina, donated the embryos to her. And then she, a few years ago, actually now it was six years ago. I was going to oh say, gosh, I was like, I think this is a while ago. It feels, <laughs> it seems, it feels like now yesterday. Six years, yeah, has, um, has, a, has an, I was able to have another daughter um, named Helen. So out of that whole batch of, of embryos that were made back in 2007, we've got three beautiful girls. And I think what's the most beautiful thing about this whole experience that we've had is that you know, I now have this extended family. They have this Mm -hmm. extended family. The girls will grow up knowing each other and knowing that they're sisters, but having the benefit of not having to grow up with each other and share, (laughs) share moms. And bathrooms. And bathrooms and and clothes and And all those kind of things. Although we do, we do all the hand-me-downs, right? (laughs) And it's great. We share stories. Hey, does, you know, did this happen to Ruby? Um, You know, is this going on with Lila? You know, things like that. It's just, it's really nice to have this community um, that we built and baby girl number one's name is Ruby, by the way. Yes, baby. Yes, <laughs> yes it not, wasn't not me, you, Ruby. It wasn't me. Although I'm sure everybody's very interested in what's happening with me all the time. I'm always yeah. No, no. B- baby girl Ruby is actually thirteen year old teen Ruby. I'm, yes, I'm always in the process of growth and development. Yes. And so, um, yeah, it's just been a really wonderful um, experience, and we try to see each other as much as possible. In fact, um, Serafina and and Helen and and me and I girls and we're all going to meet up I think next weekend and go to um, Cougar Mountain Zoo and we try to meet up every so often and um, Ruby came up last summer by herself her first first flight by herself and, and I have and to say I love seeing photos of the girls together because yeah, yeah. they are so sisters it's pretty amazing I mean of course they would be but you look at them together and you're like wow it's just a little mini me in certain ways so they 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 totally are and but also such very different personalities and yeah. strangely enough you know we always play that is it nurture versus nature uh-huh. game <laughs> you know is this nur- you know Lila thing is this nurture or nature and it's just amazing how similar I I think, you know, if you just look at Lila, I mean, a lot of people look at her and they, when I tell them a story, and I'm, I I share my story with anybody um, who wants and to know. And actually you confirmed that the other people were fine with you sharing their story as well. So yes, just, everyone definitely. Everyone yes. is all on board. Everybody's on board. Open. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and people are shocked. They're like, oh, but she looks so much like you. And, uh, and then I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, I don't know. Sometimes it's just. It's kind of like dogs and their owners. I don't know. Like, <laughs> you know, it's it's hard to say. And then in some ways, do they like, all love ketchup as much as Lila, or is Lila like into the ketchup more, into the chup more than everybody else? <laughs> Probably <laughs> more so. But it, the the um, the obsession with the chup has has decreased a little bit over oh, the okay. years. <laughs> I mean, they're just they're all very they're all very different, but they're also also very similar in a lot of ways to their to their moms and stuff. And yeah. and Lila understands. Like you know, she, I have I have. I've always told her about her her upbringing. I tell her, "Hey, you were in the freezer for three months as an embryo," and I tell her the story three of how years, she, right? three years she was in the yeah. yeah, and how she was conceived. And I have a baby book for her. It has pictures of Erica as a little girl. It has the the biography of the sperm donor. It's got a picture of the sperm donor. It's got pictures of her as a fetus on my ultrasound pictures. I mean, it's everything. She knows there's no, I wanted to always be really open for her because I always wanted her to understand. And so she, she understands that we're not genetically related, but, and she knows that she has these sisters and she knows that she's genetically related. I don't know. She really understands the whole concept of, of genes Mm -hmm. as many people don't really understand you know, genes. And I think a lot of people are confused. You know, they say, they don't know what to say. Like, is she your biological child? And I say, well, you know, she is, I carried her, I gave birth to her. We are not genetically related, you know, but she is my child. Like she is, she, as much as Marley, she is, she is my child and, and I am her mother and she, she loves her sisters and she knows she know Auntie Erica and Auntie Natalie and Auntie Serafina and and all of those things, but there is no doubt in her mind like who is her mother. And when I when she was born, I remember holding her for the first time, and I there was that feeling of will she ever love me? Will will she accept me? You know because mm-hmm. I'm 
wasn't sure if I really felt like, was I really her mother? And then like, she has <laughs> <laughs> one of the most loving, sometimes clingy, but beautiful, wonderful, happiest, you know, child I've ever known. And, and I wouldn't trade her for anything. She's exactly the, the child. I mean, I, I love Marley and Marley's the child that I always needed and wanted. And, and Lila is exactly the same as well. So I feel so, so happy and so privileged and so lucky to be able to call them my girls. I always get these like joyful chills whenever I hear your story. So I just, I just love it so much. And I have, I yeah, I have the biggest grin on my face. You guys can't see me, but it's just so beautiful. And from the point of view for the girls too, I know, you know, Amanda, like I'm an only child. And like, I just think about from Ruby's perspective, it's got to be kind of cool to have this sort of sister. But again, it's it's like, it's, it is a unique experience. And I know for me growing up, I always wished I had siblings. And so like, as she's getting older, does she still, you said she came up to see you. So obviously she's still into having contact. Has, has that relationship been different than you thought it would be? I think I didn't know what it would be like. I always not having a sister myself growing up. And it's interesting because Erica doesn't have a sister. Natalie doesn't have a sister. Sarah yeah. doesn't have a sister. I think we've all kind of romanticized what the sister yeah. relationship is <laughs> I like. See that. Yeah. And so I've always like, I, I don't know. Uh, to me, I'm always like, to, hey, Lila, you know, hey, Lila, did you did you text Ruby that? Did you ask Ruby that? Or, you know, are you guys texting each other? And she's like, Mom, you know, like, please, we don't, we don't, you know, we don't do all of those things. I think I'm just really excited. I'm excited for all of them. I'm excited yeah. that they have this relationship, that there's this potential, and they can make it whatever they want it to be, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I wouldn't lie if I didn't romanticize a little bit this idea that they all grow up and move to New York City together and get an apartment. <laughs> That'd be a you great know, sitcom, and share though. each other's oh, shoes yeah. and clothes and and and, and, and then I don't, fight crime. You know? Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, but um I um I'm just so excited for the future and mm -hmm. and and I think that one of the things that that I think Erica and Natalie and Seraphina and, and I of all really want to see happen is we just want to see the relationship between these girls to unfold as naturally as possible and it, mm -hmm. for it to be whatever it is that, that they want it to be. Um, but I will always have all of them as a priority in our lives because they are Lila's family. They are my family. They are Jason's family. They're Mar Marley's family. We are, we are all family. We are an extended family of people that, that came together because we both worked at the same fertility clinic. So it's just remarkable how you don't expect these things in your life to happen or life to turn out the way that you thought it would be, or you have this idea or dream of what your family is going to look like. And it may not happen exactly as you hoped it would be, but nonetheless, it can be a really beautiful experience. And I'm just really happy, happy that we did that. And if you have listeners who are kind of wanting to understand more about embryo donation, like where would you direct people? I know there's so much out there. And one of the challenges is a lot of organizations that focus on this tend to be very faith-based and tend to have a lot of restrictions on who's even available. So, you know, what, what would you say to someone that just wants to kind of figure out what their starting point could be if they were maybe interested in being part of an embryo adoption donation? I know there's a lot of terminology. I mean, I think that the first thing you have to do is just talk to your team at your mm -hmm. clinic. Yeah, you really do. You need to bring it up. I don't necessarily think, and, may, and maybe that's changed, but I don't necessarily think a lot of providers think, think about, about that mm -hmm. because they know that people are, in general, I mean, you know, they want to have, they want to have their own biological, genetic child like we get that you know and that of course is going to be the goal but that may not be the journey for everybody and that might not be the right decision for everybody you know it really depends and I, I remember when I was a fertility nurse you know I, I said if you have in your heart to have a child you will if you have in your heart to, to be a mother it will happen but it may not just happen the way that you thought it was going to happen and as long as you keep your mind open you keep your heart open you keep your options open like it, it will happen for you. It absolutely will happen for you. But that's that's what you've got to do. 
And so if you don't hear this coming from your provider, then it's something to maybe bring up to your provider is, you know, is this something that you think would be an option for me? Is this something that's an option here at, here at this clinic? And if it's not, or if there's other options available to me, or there's other areas I should be looking, can you help direct me? I mean, that's what your providers should help you do. So, so that's what I would recommend. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of the Whole Pineapple Podcast. We hope it was helpful. If you know someone who could benefit from hearing the podcast, we hope you'll share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the Whole Pineapple on your favorite podcast app. Every rating and review makes us easier to find. This podcast is sponsored by Seattle Reproductive Medicine and is produced by Audiotocracy Podcast Production. We'll see you next time. Have a delicious week.